and good afternoon everyone and welcome to the 16th installment of our University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation's Stop COVID Deaths webinar series where we tackle clinical management updates on COVID-19 cases. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Director of the National Telehealth Center at the National Institutes of Health at the University of the Philippines, Manila. And as always, I'm very happy to share the floor, share the stage with a dear mentor and my beloved friend, Dr. Susi Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susi? Hi, good morning, Raymond. Magandang umaga po, magandang hapon po, magandang tanghali sa lahat ng mga nakikinig. Uh, welcome to our 16th webinar. Uh, marami po tayong magandang pag-usapan. We'd like to greet people who are watching all the way from Saudi Arabia to Cagayan de Oro. And just thank everyone for being part of this regular, uh, this regular activity on learning more about COVID and how we can stop COVID deaths. Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Susi. For those who are just joining us uh, to, for today or at least for season two, so alam nyo po na today po, not just for today, but uh, for starting po last week, we started our season two, which uh, ushers in a new format for our discussions and what we call this format is the virtual grand rounds. So dito po sa virtual grand rounds, uh, we highlight a particular case. Uh, and last week we were discussing the doctor as a patient where we featured Dr. Brody C. And for today po, we will have a very special and very interesting case to be tackled by our distinguished panelists and a roster of speakers po. And in this format, we will be uh, uh, focusing po on the case of the patient, using the backdrop po in terms of the different dilemmas that our uh, medical teams experience on a daily basis, dalo na po dito po sa kaso ng COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Susie? Yes, yeah, so Raymond, we've got uh, an interesting case, a um, uh, COVID-negative mother who delivers to a COVID-positive baby. But I think beyond that, um, we're also going to tackle what, what it means for health workers to continuously see um, tragic events. So while this webinar is about stopping COVID deaths, we cannot avoid the fact that we are going to have patients who will die, who will leave us. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about death, what that means about uh, for, for our health workers and our spirituality as, as doctors when we encounter these uh, these types of these types of events because truly this pandemic is not just about people getting sick you know my Raymond my one of my friends once just said to me last night God is reordering the world parang binabago niya yung mundo and so we have to not just listen but also reflect on what this all means to us as health workers as well as to our patients. Thank you, Dr. Susi. Napaganda po ng sinabi niyo, no? I mean, reordering by the being uh, who is uh, higher than us uh, and to be able to just understand all of these things and put everything into context po. Uh, just for those who are, again, uh, joining us, the, our format po for the webinar will be, initially, we will have a case presentation and then moving on to a panel discussion and then moving on na po towards our Q&A, wherein the questions from our audience will be tackled po by each of our guest speakers. And before we move forward with the introduction of our uh, opening remarks speaker, I would like to acknowledge po the different uh, institutions who make up this incredible team, which I am very, very privileged to be part of. Uh, it starts po at the Office of the President and the Office of the Executive Vice President at the University of the Philippines. Uh, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, uh, the uh, TVU people, uh, it will not be possible po. Uh, for those who are joining us in the playback, for those who are joining us po who were not able to join us here at the Zoom webinar and have been directed to the YouTube channel of TVUP, maraming salamat po uh, sa panonood po. We also have our uh, partners po over at the University of the Philippines, Manila, at the Office of the Chancellor, the Office of uh, at the National Institutes of Health, National Telehealth Center, the Philippine General Hospital, and the UP College of Medicine. And finally, and last but not the least, po, our partners over at the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. So before Dr. Susie introduces po our opening remarks speaker, this is the part where I mentioned po again, kasi po uh, uh, by the tense na po talaga, 
uh, nag-email at nagpapadala po ng mensahe po tungkol po sa kanilang certificates. Kailan po ba darating ang certificates? Bakit po wala pa po ang certificates? So, yung pong mga certificates have been distributed po from at least from webinar 1 to webinar 12. For webinars 13 onwards po, uh, the presentations po kasi are still being revised by our uh, resource persons po. Uh, so, before we upload them, we try to get their consent in terms of the version of the presentations that will be uploaded po. So, ang tabayaan nyo lang po yun kasi kasabay po ng inyong certificates ay ang link po to the presentation that was given for that particular webinar. And as always, yung pong pangalan na i-input po ninyo, uh, ma maigi po na maging maingat po sa pag-enter po kasi kung ano po yung mag a dun po sa inyong in-enter sa registration, ayun po ang pangalan na lalabas po. So, over to Dr. Susi. Parang passport pala yan, Raymond, ano? Pag nagkamali ka na. <laughs> nagkamali ng, ng spelling dun sa certificate nyo. Okay, we're just making this Uh, a little light for you. We've got a fascinating set of speakers today and we're going to start off with uh, a brief introduction from uh, the newly minted, the newly minted Deputy Director of the Philippine General Hospital who's been really quietly, again, one of those persons who's been quietly working behind the scenes to make this happen. It, it, it's really, um, what should I say? It's really a huge coordination Uh, endeavor to bring people together to come up with with the grand rounds and uh, when she was designated by the Dean to to handle this wow I mean this really took off so may I introduce to you Dr. Stella Marie Jose who is the chair of the curriculum committee of the College of Medicine but is also now the new deputy uh, director of PGH Stella good morning good afternoon good, morning. good afternoon uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Susie and Raymond, it's nice to be invited to, to be the opening remarks. Speaker. Oh, what does it feel like? Stella, what does it feel like to be the deputy director of PGH? My goodness. How do you balance that with your your love life and your family life? <laughs> oh, how do you manage uh, um, You know, uh, as my predecessor, Dr. Juliet Shaw Aguilar said, It's like playing the piano, Stella. Sabi niya, there's, you know, one, one will be for the nurses' concern, the residents' concerns, the the admin, the other administrative concerns. You know, even dietary is under the health operations, and there were so many who became COVID positive with the dietary section. Wow. So, so sobrang investigation namin yan. So it's already remedied, and then of course the HICO, the Hospital Infection Control Unit, that's also under my my um, my. Uh, my office so it's a daunting task but uh i'm trying to make you know i'm trying to keep up with all the things happening in the hospital because we're a covid that a covid referral center but now all hospitals must must admit 30 percent covid patients so hindi na siya covid referral center hospital as it is uh, everybody is encouraged to have covid patients Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, if you guys know Stella, she plays the piano really well. So, so for her to say, the, to say that this is like playing the piano, I think we're looking forward to, to a very good, uh, no, no, to, to uh, what should I say, somebody who's really going to be on top of operations, very complicated matter. Raymond. Very complicated. Uh, thank you po, uh, Dr. Stella, for uh, joining us and for also getting together with all of the department, clinical department chairs at PGH so for them to be able to nominate cases for our virtual grand rounds. I know that might not be, that was not an easy task to be able to do that and uh, that, that, that's really one of the many, many, many reasons po that we are very thankful for your involvement po and for your active participation in this preparation po. Thank you. And especially po for the case that you will be, uh, well, uh, identified po uh, for today, Dr. Stella. Stella, go ahead and uh, give us your introduction for our audience. Sige. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to the virtual Grand Rounds of the UP Phil Health webinar series. We will be presenting an interesting patient That, okay, that's a, an OB patient, an obstetric patient, uh, who came in as a COVID-negative mother, but she gave birth to a COVID-positive baby. 
Uh, we are lucky that we have distinguished panelists for today. And uh, we have Dr. Sibyl Lizan Bravo, the Section Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the PGH. So she's an, a clinical assistant professor. And we have Marimel Pagkatipunan, Associate Professor in Pediatrics, Division of Infectious, uh, Infections and Tropical Diseases in Pediatrics. And of course, we have Dr. Lulu Bravo, Professor Emeritus from the Department of Psychiatry uh, to discuss the mental health issues in this case. So at the end of this webinar, we hope that you, our audience, would gather, would have acquired nuggets of knowledge in regarding COVID-19 in pregnancy, which can be helpful in your clinical practice. Ray Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Stella. Uh, and um, uh, uh, by the way, Stella, it's, it's Dr. Lulu Ignacio. I'm sorry, Dr. Lulu Ignacio. Yes. Oh my, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Malaking uh, papa. Yeah, oh, we're, with sorry. Dr. we're, do we're do with Dr. Ignacio sorry. this afternoon mm -hmm. because we're going to um, we're going we're going to look a little bit at what how do we deal with overwhelming situations? And I think in in all of our grand rounds, we'll want to to do more than just talk about clinical management, but talk about the human. Uh, the human side of, of of the pandemic. So thanks, thanks so much, Stella. You're staying with us, right? So you'll yes, be on the panel yes, later. Yes, yes. And uh, Stella, Stella was really, uh, which is very excited about this case, as I hope yes. <laughs> uh, you are. Okay, Raymond, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Susie, and thank you also to PJH Deputy Director for Health Operations, Dr. Stella Marie Jose, for that heartwarming message. So last, Dr. Susie, Susie mentioned. Uh, we will wait for uh, Dr. Stella Pot to join our panel discussion later after the presentations have been given by our roster of speakers. Po. And at this point, I think uh, this will be the part wherein we launch our, our fun quiz or ang ating uh, pre-test webinar questions. Uh, if you click on the polls, I think this uh, it will show you uh, the ones that are the questions uh, nominated by each of our uh, presenters and each of our discussants po. Uh, may we have the polls to be launched po. I think the poll po kasi is still closed. Okay, as we wait for the, uh, po, for the launching of the pre-test questions in the polls, uh, I, I think this will be the part Okay, we're having our okay. It, it, I think we're we're having technical issues po in launching the polls. Um, so while Raymond, we wait Raymond, for Raymond, we're going to from Hospital ng Palawan, uh, surgical orthopedic ward nursing staff. So good afternoon to you. Hey, mga good afternoon po. Yes, po. Uh, so we have also um, attendees po from. Well, not just from local but also from international po as always. Uh, unahin na rin po natin ang ating mga local attendees. We have ones from uh, Vegan in Ilocos Sur. Uh, we have ones from Nueva Ecija in Central Luzon. From Vera Catanduanes in Bicol region. From Naga Cebu from Central Visayas. From Cebu Tad, Zamboanga del Norte, Zamboanga Peninsula. And from Coronadal City in Sok Sargent. Internationally, I think this is the very first time that we will have attendees from Johannesburg, from South Africa, wow. from Cardiff, Wales in the United Kingdom, Masi Nagudi in India, from Pematang Siantar North, Sumatra in Indonesia, and we also have our resident um, attendees from Riverside, California, from Doha, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and from Abu Dhabi. So it really goes to show in terms of the reach ng ating webinar series po and the topic and how important and how interesting po talaga the topic that we will be talking about. Um, so as as we are trying to fix our technical issues with the polls, I think uh, not to waste any time po, but uh, I'll give the floor over to Dr. Susie for, um, I think. Oh, there we go. 
Raymond, okay. we're up. The poll is up. Yeah, there okay, you go. so the questions poll, we will have four questions for the polls for today. The very first question states uh, the following statements are true except option A, further validation of COVID-19 transmission should be facilitated, especially if the mother's RT-PCR result yielded negative and the newborn's result yielded positive. Okay, that was a mouthful, pero I hope you gave join us in this very fun quiz. Wala pong pressure sa pagsagot po nito. It's just a way for us to be able to uh, measure po kung gano'n po ang ating nalaman towards the end of the webinar po kasi the answers to these poll questions will be provided by our guest speakers. Options two, option 2 states, it may be prudent to expedite delivery for COVID-19 mothers with severe to critical symptoms. Option C, the use of nitrous oxide or laughing gas as an anesthetic is highly recommended and option D states severe COVID-19 may result in elevated transaminase. So, tandaan nyo po, no? So, ang tanong po kasi ay alin po dito ang true maliban sa yun po ang uh, katanungan sa question number one for question number two. A suspected rare maternal fetal transmission was detected to an infected pregnant woman. She was asked to take an investigational drug for COVID-19. Which of the following drugs should you question due to its detrimental effects on neonates? Option A, chloroquine phosphate. Option B, lopinavir, ritonavir. Option C, ribavirin. And option D, remdesivir. Okay? So please uh, feel free to input po your answers in this uh, pre-webinar questions po uh, for our question number three. The ideal test for a 35-year-old pregnant patient at 31 weeks age of gestation is Option A, PCR swab test Option B, serum antibody test Option C, nasal swab antigen test And Option D, combination of PCR and antibody test po. And last but not least, our question number four uh, the following are the Filipinos' major coping mechanisms. Option A, spiritual. Option B, the Bayanihan spirit. Option C, joy or humor. And option D, all of the above. So please feel free to input your answers po uh, as we are going through all of the questions and as we went through all of them, it looks like uh, responses are coming in although... Uh, given that we already have reached our standing room only or our maximum capacity for Zoom webinar, uh, we still would like everyone po as much as possible to join in answering po our uh, poll questions. So uh, just just uh, continue to input po your uh, answers to the questions as we move uh, towards the next section of our uh, webinar. So in this webinar, po talaga, like what we mentioned, the concept for, for the virtual grand rounds is really about the art of storytelling. And to help set our case study in context for our viewers, uh, a, a short video po was prepared by the TVUP team, and I hope we'll be able to show that at this time. Benita finds herself pregnant at the age of 27. She is single and comes from a conservative family. Life has not been easy for her. She was born with a congenital heart defect, patent ductus arteriosus. She was given some medications when she was three months old. She claims it is difficult for her to sleep without two pillows under her head. If she tries to walk up two flights of stairs, she would be out of breath.
On the 28th week of pregnancy, she experiences a persistent cough. On the 30th week of pregnancy, she starts spitting out blood and has difficulty breathing. She consulted at the ER of a hospital and a chest x-ray was taken. Chest x-ray results showed hazy densities in the right upper lung fields. The initial impression was pulmonary tuberculosis. She was given medications and was sent home. Four hours prior to admission, she has regular uterine contractions and a bloody show. She consulted at a lying-in center, but was transferred to a bigger hospital. On admission, her blood pressure was 170 over 110, heart rate 85, respiratory rate 24, with oxygen saturation of 82%, which improved to 88% with administration of 10 ml oxygen via nasal cannula. Okay, so that's a, such a, again, a very uh, emotional presentation of, of the case. Thank you, TVUP, for that. And that sets the tone for uh, the case that we're going to hear about today. And it's my privilege to uh, welcome our presenter, Dr. Hannah Sombilia. She is the Infectious Disease Division Fellow of the Department of Obstetri Obstetrics and Gynecology of the Philippine General Hospital. Hannah, welcome to our webinar. Thank you, ma'am. Have a um, good afternoon po, and also good afternoon to everyone and to Dr. Raymond as well. Okay, Hannah, you look great. Uh, you know, the, I remember in the olden days, uh, Raymond, the OB rotation was really toxic, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's physically, a physically draining rotation for clerks and interns, but uh, Hannah's the, and Hannah's the fellow for infectious disease. So, um, Hannah, how, how, how are you coping now? Uh, I, I don't think you realized that COVID was coming when you applied to be a fellow. What is it like to be the infectious disease fellow at the Philippine General Hospital for Obstetrics and Gynecology? Uh, Ma'am, it was really um, a good timing na I'm a fellow, ma'am, during this pandemic. Actually, I did not expect this. I only thought that I would be um, handling um, HIV cases. Um, but this pandemic um, really taught me a lot of things. Taught me the, how to be more careful um, in um, disease, um, in disease, um, what do you call this? Um, in handling mom's patients because um, our goal is not only to um, give um, cure but also to pr protect ourselves mom from being um, infected also from of the virus man. yeah right huge challenge Raymond no how do we how do we keep our health workers uh, free free from COVID I'm sure Raymond your colleagues and your classmates who are really in the hospitals in the front line are also facing this. So a, a lot of us, uh, I think, uh, were able to see this. There was a viral photo po that was shared from, I think, from the PGH Medical Foundation. It depicts po two healthcare workers who were in their full PPE gears and they were nakasalampak po sila sa floor and there was a sign there saying to not remove the PPEs. It was just really very symbolic of, uh, let's say, the amount of work, the burden that the healthcare workers have been uh, carrying on their shoulders, all well, metaphorically po. And uh, the way that uh, we have been able to fight this uh, pandemic, po, it, really, it really will just usher in something from you innately in terms of uh, being able to sympathize and empathize with our colleagues who are really in the trenches and who are uh, fighting this uh, disease po, uh, face to face, if you will, on a daily basis. So uh, on behalf of everyone, I think uh, 
uh, we would like to like maybe, maybe na put in the pedestal po ang ating mga frontline workers and uh, healthcare workers po in terms of the work that you have been doing and for taking care of all of the patients and because we have been reaching our critical care utilization po uh, at near maximum capacity that is something to be to behold you are really uh, serving as the last line po in terms of uh, if, if it were a dam na bago po mag-break ang dam kayo po talaga ang naghahawak-hawak kamay so maraming salamat po sa inyong ginagawa so um, Dr. Susie or Dr. Hannah yeah, so I think Raymond, that's an, so, such an important point. No, I think I just want to acknowledge also that, as Raymond has said, everyone everyone's tired, everyone's working so hard, and um, it's not easy. It is not easy to be a, uh, a doctor, a health worker in 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 this time of the pandemic. And just to mention also, Raymond, before we turn the floor over to Hannah, that uh, these first two stories we've given have featured uh, UP and the Philippine General Hospital. But in the, next, uh, in the next webinars, we're going to have other medical schools and other hospitals as we did in the first episode so that we really get a good representation of uh, what's happening on the ground to all of our health workers. And of course, what, what kind of cases doctors are encountering. So Hannah, uh, this is now your moment to present your case uh, over to you. Go ahead, Dr. Hanna. Please share your screen po. Okay, I think here we go. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, this is a case of a 27-year-old Gravida 1 Para 0 who came in due to regular uterine contractions. One day prior to admission, the patient had irregular uterine contractions not accompanied by bloody or watery vaginal discharge. At this time, no consult was done and no medications were taken. Few hours prior to admission, the patient noted regular uterine contractions. Um, it was now accompanied by bloody vaginal discharge. Hence, consult was done. The patient went to other health facilities before consulting in the admitting institution. Our patient is a known case of congenital heart disease. Patent ductus arteriosus um, resolved at three months of life. On the interim, no follow-up checkup with a cardiologist was done. The patient developed easy fatigability and two pillow orthopnea, but denied episodes of worsening cyanosis. The patient was admitted at 28 weeks and three days age of gestation in a government hospital for three weeks history of cough accompanied by hemoptysis and difficulty of breathing. She was clinically diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis and was started on HRZE. During her admission, RT-PCR for COVID-19 was done and the result came in after 10 days and it was negative. The personal, family, and social history were non-contributory. For the prenatal workup, um, the patient had four unremarkable prenatal checkups in a private physician. However, monitoring, monitoring for her cardiac problem was not done. For the pertinent review of systems, the patient is a GCS 15 oriented to time, person, and place. She denied blurring of vision. She had an occasional two-pillow orthopnea and exertional dyspnea. She had cough difficulty of breathing, and clubbing of nails. Upon arriving at the emergency room, the patient had a BP of 170 over 110, heart rate of 85, um, RR of 24. She was a febrile, and her autosaturation was 82%. On chest examination, she had a dynamic precordium, regular heart rhythm, with distinct S1 and S2. Fixed splitting of S2 and palpable S2 was noted with point of maximal impulse at the third intercostal space located at the left parasternal border. No thrills, no heaves, no murmurs were noted. Breath sounds were difficult to auscultate at the time. On abdominal examination, she had good fetal heart tones. 
with fundic height of 24 centimeters and an estimated fetal weight of 1.2 to 1.4 kilograms. On internal examination, her cervix was 3 cm dilated, 50% effaced cephalic, head at station minus 3 with intact bags. Um, it was also noted that our patient had gloved fingernails and grade 1 bipedal edema. At this time, the admitting impression was pregnancy uterine, 30 weeks and 2 days age of gestation, cephalic in preterm labor. Gestational hypertension, rule out preeclampsia. Pulmonary tuberculosis, clinically diagnosed, ongoing intensive phase treatment. Gravidocardiac functional class 2, secondary to congenital heart disease, to consider atrial septal defect, rule out patent ductus arteriosus in acute decompensation. Rule out congestive heart failure. COVID-19 probable, gravida 1, para 0. Her treatment plan included BP control by giving hydralazin. She was given a total of three doses and her blood pressure was maintained at 150 over 100. Seizure prophylaxis was done by giving magnesium sulfate. Preeclampsia workup was also done by requesting for CBC, saturine albumin, creatinine, LDH, ASD, and ALT. To manage her gravitocardia condition, the patient was um, placed on continuous O2 support at 10 liters per minute via face mask. She was also referred to the cardiolo cardiology service for co-management and um, 12 lead ECG, chest x-ray, electrolytes, 2D echo were all requested. However, 12 lead ECG was, all, was only done. The 12 lead ECG revealed regular sinus rhythm, right axis deviation, right atrial enlargement to consider right ventricular hypertrophy versus right ventricular strain and nonspecific ST wave changes. To control her preterm labor, the patient was given magnesium sulfate. Dexamethasone was also given to promote fetal lung maturity. To investigate the cause of preterm labor, urine CS, sputum CS, rectovaginal and endocervical swab were requested. The patient was also referred to the OB infectious diseases and pulmonology service for co-management and to the anesthesiology service for epidural catheter insertion in case the labor progresses. On the second hour of labor, her BP rose to 160 over 100. Another dose of hydralazin was given and her beat blood pressure was 150 over 100. At this time, the patient had a category 2 trace for minimal variability with strong contractions occurring every 4 minutes. Repeat or internal examination was done and it showed labor progression with 6 cm cervical dilatation. The patient was referred back to the anesthesia service for epidural catheter insertion. However, after a few minutes, the patient had labored breathing and developed circumoral cyanosis. Oxygen saturation was noted to decrease to 65%. Hence, she was referred for intubation to secure the airway. On the third hour of admission, um, the patient still had elevated BP, tachycardia, tachypnea, and O2 saturation of 60 to 70% at 10 liters per minute oxygen support. The patient delivered via spontaneous vaginal delivery to a live baby girl preterm 31 weeks by pediatric aging with an APGAR score of 7 becoming 8. Post delivery, her BP normalized to 110 over 70, but her O2 saturation dropped to 20%. The assessment at this time was acute decompensated heart failure. The patient was intubated and was given furosemide. Post-intubation, the oxygen saturation improved to 40%. However, her blood pressure dropped to 50 over 30. Hence, norepinephrine drip was started and fluid resuscitate and resuscitation was done. However, after 5 minutes, the vital signs were noted to decline. Hence, ACLS was started. However, after 15 minutes of attempted resuscitation, 
the patient expired. Postmortem nasal pharyngeal swab for COVID-19 was done. On the other hand, um, the baby was tested for COVID-19 at the 30th hour of life, and the result was positive. The, the baby fought, however, at the ninth day of life, the baby also expired. These laboratory results came in post-mortem. This case was signed out as the compensated right-sided heart failure secondary to pregnancy, gravidocardiac functional class 2 to 3, congenital heart disease to consider atrial septal defect, rule out patent ductus arteriosus with Eisenmenger syndrome, HELP syndrome, pulmonary tuberculosis, clinically diagnosed, ongoing intensive phase treatment, pregnancy uterine delivered vaginally, to a preterm live baby girl, small for gestational age, early neonatal death, secondary to severe COVID-19 infection. COVID-19 rule out, Gravida 1, Para 1, 0100. In summary, sadness, frustration, helplessness, guilt, false feeling of incompetence, and the weight of informing the bad news to the relatives were some of the things that haunt us whenever a patient dies in our hands. COVID-19 pandemic made it worse. A lot of patients had limited access to medical care due to various reasons like fear of getting infected, limited internet access, limited mode of transportation, no hospital vacancy, and poverty to name a few. The patient came in in a decompensating state, with available resources at hand, limited known past medical history, and the difficulty of wearing a PPE. The whole team did everything they can in the fastest possible time to save the mother. When the mother died, they still hoped that the baby may survive. There are times when things get out of our control and we can only cling to God our ultimate physician. With God's help, emotional healing is achieved by improving ourselves to be the best physician that we can be for our future patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, uh, for for sharing for sharing that um, that case, and um, also sharing some of your your personal thoughts on. On this on this case and I think for for those of us who are in who are watching uh, this is not an uncommon um, sentiment or feeling for doctors who are who have to deal with tragedy uh, so I think now Raymond we let's bring in the rest of our the rest of our and time. yeah so uh, we're going to call on so we can have everyone on screen I believe and we're going to have um, Dr. Sibyl Zane Bravo, uh, Division Chief of Infectious Diseases uh, of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. We're going to have also a pediatrician, Dr. Marimel Pagkatipunan, who is on the COVID management team for, for PEDIA, and Dr. Lourdes Ignacio, who is Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry. So uh, can we have all of you open your, open Camera your cameras and turn on your mics? Uh, so that the audience can see everyone. Okay, I think. Do we have I think we're seeing Dr. Sibyl and Dr. Jing. Magandang hapon po. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, is Dr. Ignacio on board already? Yes. Ma'am Lulu is... Uh, okay, we're seeing Ma'am Lulu's video po. Okay. So thank you, everyone po, for, uh, for all of our panelists uh, for uh, being Enjoy able to uh, join okay. us po. Uh, Raymond, let's ask Stella to also join us, uh, Dr. Stella Jose, who's, OB, who's, who's also an obstetrician gynecologist. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Chancellor Manchit Padilla also with us. Uh, and she's going to give us some, some of the, her thoughts also after she's a pediatrician. So, um, Chancy, please, please, open your, please open your video. video. Okay, so we're going to start uh, with, with some some remarks from uh, Dr. Sibyl Bravo, who's the Division Chief of Infectious Disease for, 
Obstetrics and Gynecology of PGH. Sybil, over to you. Well, good afternoon, dear doctors and everyone uh, in the room. Thank you very much for having me. Um, first, of course, I wasn't the direct um, physician of the case. No? We had the patient, the case was referred to us being the OB uh, infectious disease specialist in our institution. Um, but of course, in these cases, I put my foot at the actual case. I imagine myself um, being hands on. So just like what Hannah said, donning the PPE and all. And of course, doing everything, trying to save the patient. So what Hannah said, I also felt that way. It's just so sad that uh, we have been experiencing now no, shortages of beds and hospitals. And more than half of our patients, they would tell us on admission that they have been to from two hospitals to as much as eight hospitals with no vacancy. They were turned down. They were literally turned away. And of course, when they came into our emergency section, they're at, well, some of them would be at the late state of their condition. Most of them, they're in imminent labor. Okay, thank you. Yes, Th thank you, Dr. Sibyl. Um, I believe you have a set of slides po, for your discussion of the case. Uh, uh, please feel free to share your screen, uh, ma'am. There we go, okay. Okay, so we have here, we are presented no, with a mortality case of a primigravid who delivered preterm at our institution. The pertinent data are as follows. She had a congenital heart disease that of ASD, cannot roll out um, patent duplex arteriosis. And of course, she also presented with hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. And of course, Prior to admission, she to this admission, she was also diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis at another government hospital, where in the initial COVID results were negative. And as was mentioned by our initial presenter, the post-mortem COVID examination for our patient was also negative. So this, this brings us to really the complexity of the case, including the diagnostics that we use in uh, diagnosing COVID infection. So we have here uh, two situations in mind. No, we have to investigate the possibility of a false negative PCR result and assume that our patient had COVID infection. So to understand it, we need to discuss briefly the reasons for a false negative test and then tackle the relation to the infection with congenital heart problem. This is further complicated by preeclampsia and other uh, medical conditions. If this were a case of, of a gravid patient with a false negative PCR result for COVID, uh, we treat her you know, as a COVID confirmed case, then look into the effects of, as I mentioned, the infection in pregnancy, as well as, um, of course, uh, check the relation of COVID infection with congenital heart problem, hypertensive disorder, and of course, her tuberculosis. If these were a case of a patient with a true negative COVID PCR result, then of course we treat her as a COVID negative case. Okay? So the course would have been related to her cardiac condition, aggravated again by her other medical conditions. So we need to understand the diagnostic test in order for us to have a grasp of the possibility that this case was a false negative PCR test. So what is a positive test result? It means that the person, um, the sample now, taken from him or from her is currently infected by the virus. Whereas a negative test means that uh, the person is not currently infected by the virus. The virus is not present at the site where the sample was taken from, or it was a poor quality, or that the sampling you know, was done too early, or at the converse site, it was done too late in the infection to, de to de detect the replicating virus. So negative test results require new patient samples to be taken a few days later to reduce the chance of incorrectly um, missing an infected person, especially, of course, when you have high index of suspicion. So these are the causes no, of false negative SARS-CoV-2 PCR tests versus incorrect timing of specimen collection. 
The second would be your sample collection techniques. And the third could be your individual variability in amount of viral shedding. So first is incorrect timing no, of uh, sample collection. Um, researchers from Johns Hopkins Hospital found that obtaining the um, sample no, too early, of course, you have very high false negative rates. And of course, as you um, go on with time, no, especially at the symptom onset, kung kailan siya magkakaroon ng respiratory symptoms in particular, that would be one of the best times no, of obtaining the sample for uh, doing the test. And at around a week after you know, the infection or around three days after um, onset of the symptom, you will have the highest uh, false negative rate, that of 20%, or let's say you would have an 80% uh, chances of detecting the infection. So we see here, um, this figure shows the estimated timeline of diagnostic markers for detecting the infection, the virus. In most individuals with symptomatic COVID infection, viral, viral RNA in the nasopharyngeal swab becomes detectable as early as day one of symptoms. So let's just concentrate on the blue line. Now, this is the nasopharyngeal swab using the PCR test. We see here that um, it's, it would yield not the highest for a positive result when you do your collection at the right time. But of course, it's not a perfect test still because we see here that even for some of our patients, there could be really chance, you know, even if you collect it at the ideal time, you know, let's say a week after her potential exposure or infection, or um, at least three days from onset of symptoms, if the patient will become symptomatic, you will still have false negative results. So for our patient, they again, the initial test done at another government hospital on May 28 to be exact was negative. And again, on current admission around 10 days after, we still got a negative result, though again, this was taken post-mortem. So clearly we have three scenarios here. It, the first scenario could be that the patient was not really infected at the first admission at the first government hospital. And then the repeat test at the second admission was also negative. So she did, she was really, uh, she did get the infection. The second scenario would be that she had the infection at the first admission, but swab was also a false negative result. She eventually recovered. And then is during her second admission, no virus was detected. The reason for us obtaining a negative result. And the third could be that, again, she was not infected at the first admission, then she was discharged. She might have gotten the infection at the community level and then had a false negative test during the second admission. Whatever it would be, of course, we're considering a false negative test for scenario um, numbers two and three. And as such, the COVID infection took its toll no, with her pregnancy. As I've mentioned, uh, we could do post-mortem specimen collection when, of course, again, we have high index of suspicion and when it's very, very important to do this procedure for contact tracing in the community. And of course, for those who are involved in crime investigation, it could be part of uh, a scene investigation or part of an autopsy. So for our case, we did that for our patient, but still, uh, considering the fact that, of course, no, her stormy course would really give us a very high index of suspicion for COVID pneumonia, considering this is really now a pandemic, but still we obtain negative results. So for the second cause of false negative PCR test, we consider the type of specimen. As I've mentioned earlier, um, the nasopharyngeal a specimen no, would, according to studies, would yield the highest rate of positivity for patients who are really infected. But specimens from sputum or endotracheal aspirates for those who are intubated, including bronchoalveolar lavage among hospital, hospitalized patients, may also be sent no, for laboratory processing. And the third reason. Uh, the individual variability in amount of viral shedding. Um, studies have shown that viral shedding may begin two to three days before the symptom onset. 
And after symptom onset, viral load decrease, you know, consistent with other studies. And as such, infectiousness may actually decline significantly on day eight after symptom onset, as the virus could not anymore be detected by culture or even by swab in most studies. Okay, so analysis suggests that viral shedding again, no, as I mentioned, may begin before the symptom onset. So this is again very important uh, to consider. So again, our patient had um, negative initial results, and ten days later, her PCR swab was still negative. Assuming she was infected during her stay at the first hospital where she was swabbed, she recovered uneventfully, you know, and so 10 days later, her swab turned out to be negative also, but the infection again had negative effects on her pregnancy. Or she may have been infected you know, when she got home at the community level, the symptoms of COVID have been masked and had negative effects on her pregnancy. But if this were the case, you know, it would have been not Rather, it would not have been a false negative result. She may really have recovered, which is the reason for her negative PCR test 10 days later. So if, if our patient had a false negative PCR test and that she was truly infected, we now go into a brief review of the effects of SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy. Um, initial studies done from June, January to February would show us that um, this infection had a rather mild course no, or mild uh, outcomes or rather favorable outcomes in pregnancy. But into the latter part of this pandemic, let's say starting March until the current time, more studies have come up revealing that uh, this infection no, would really produce different adverse maternal and even neonatal outcomes. So recent studies demonstrate that for the maternal complications, there are at risk of having preterm delivery, rupture of membranes, and a difficult intubation, and of course, admission to ICU, and of course, the hypertensive complications. And for the neonatal complications, some studies would show that this virus could again be transmitted transplacentally and could result to neonatal death and, of course, intrauterine infection. So, for our patient, recall that she delivered preterm. 30 weeks, and we see here from this systematic review that um, preterm birth is a rather um, complication of SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy. As compared to the general population, the incidence of preterm birth globally is, let's say, are pegged at around 5 to 15 percent, but in this review, it was pegged at around 20 percent, so about one-fifth of our patients now can deliver preterm due to this infection. This is the mechanism why, or rather, no, for all viruses, no, for all viral infection, can induce preterm labor. So there's viral entry into the trophoblast, which, which could induce apoptosis, no, resulting to preterm birth. So again, our patient had preterm labor at 30 weeks and delivered a preterm infant. So again, our patient had also the compensated heart failure. Coupled with that is, of course, she also had a congenital heart problem that was uncorrected. No, it's more likely ito septal defect, and she developed Eisenmenger syndrome. Um, it's really hard to um, be sure of our diagnosis because she didn't bring with her any 2D echo studies and the history was not reliable. But we referred to the cardio service. Their impression was also atal septal defect, of course, uncorrected, cannot roll out PDA, but with Eisenmenger syndrome. And the patient was clearly in a compensated heart failure. Okay. So again, cardiovascular comorbidities are linked to higher mortality risk and um, in pregnancy, that is. And specifically for women you know, with congenital heart disease, they are really at risk of acquiring COVID infection, especially if they have additional comorbidities, such as, of course, heart failure or lung disease. In our case, she also had um, pulmonary tuberculosis. So patients with um, congenital heart disease are at risk of developing different complications during pregnancy, arrhythmias, stroke, and of course, pulmonary hyper hypertension. 
Our patient also had polycythemia no, with this very high hemoglobin and very high hematocrit, which results from chronic cyanosis. This is the result of her uh, uncorrected um, cardiac condition. And this is in the background of having a very low platelet count. So again, she was clearly having the health syndrome. That's hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes with low platelet. You know, that's one of the, at the other end of spectrum of having the preeclampsia, eclampsia syndrome. And as such, again, uh, hemostatic changes may lead to hyperviscosity syndrome, thromboembolic events, or cerebrovascular complications. And other complications associated with isometric syndrome no, would include um, hemoptysis, which by history our, our patient also suffered from, and other uh, diseases such as uh, having impaired renal function. So after delivery, as was mentioned by our uh, presenter, our patient had decreasing blood pressure and oxygenation because of an increase in plasma volume during pregnancy, shunt volume can increase, leading to her symptoms. And again, this was coupled with the possibility that she really harbored SARS-CoV-2 infection and, of course, her hypertensive complication. Of course, as we mentioned, no, the healthcare givers would do everything no, to uh, make this uh, patient no, survive. So they did advanced cardiovascular life support but again, the patient was not revived anymore. Now for the next um, topic that I would want to correlate our patient with is that again, assuming that our patient had an infection, can SARS-CoV-2 induce preeclampsia-like syndrome? Recalling that our patient on admission had very high blood pressure. So compared to the general population, women with uh, unrepaired ASD had high risk of preeclampsia fetal mortality and having small for gestational HBDs. So how about COVID and its relation with inducing preeclampsia? Well, studies have shown, no, I came across two studies wherein the authors tried to correlate the possibility that it was the COVID infection that uh, induced the preeclampsia, not just, not really the pregnancy itself. So for this, um, this is the proposed mechanism uh, wherein the clinical features of preeclampsia would be mainly the consequence of endothelial damage originated by placental oxidative stress, which leads to the appearance of hypertension, proteinuria, elevated liver enzymes, which our patient had, renal failure, or thrombocytopenia. So an increased incidence of preeclampsia has been reported again among patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 compared to the general population. So in this particular study, this is a very nice study because the authors was done in Barcelona, Spain, where the authors correlated again, or rather checked or investigated if COVID really induced a preeclampsia, not really pregnancy related. So for the purposes of their study, they used a certain angiogenic factors such as the obtained maternal placental growth factor and maternal serum tyrosine kinase that would be indicators that if the patient was positive for these factors, coupled with a rather high, very high LDH levels, more than 800 IU per ml, with um, abnormal no, uh, perfusion by ultrasound, then most likely it's an actual case of preeclampsia. But if the patient no, um, was negative for these factors, then they um, concluded that the preeclampsia was not pregnancy induced. It was more of the infection that induced the preeclampsia. So again, in this particular study, uh, five patients had severe preeclampsia and uh, eight, no, or rather five had pneumonia rather, or so sorry, sorry, five had severe preeclampsia among eight patients who had severe COVID pneumonia. So for the four patients, they had of course, signs and symptoms of preeclampsia, health syndrome, but they were they had normal levels of these angiogenic factors, and their LDH level was not that high. Coupled with the normal uh, Doppler ultrasound, they surmised that these patients you know, uh, had the preeclampsia that was induced by the infection. So for these four patients, um, 
all had resolution actually of their severe uh, preeclampsia upon treatment of their severe pneumonia. There was only one patient wherein they had very high levels of the lactate dehydrogenase and the patient was positive for the different antigenic um, factors, serum levels, such that they actually had to terminate the pregnancy preterm for control of the labor or for management of the case. So again, they surmised that pre the preeclampsia in these four patients who had severe pneumonia was induced by the infection. Okay, so, so much for that. Again, despite these findings, vertical transmission still appears to be very low. But several reports have shown that presence of the virus on fetal membranes you know, would prove that there is a possibility of vertical transmission. In the placenta, COVID is um, thought not to infect the endothelial cells, leading to a procoagulable state. So again, it's important that the signs of fetal and maternal malperfusion are not specific for COVID infection because it is seen in other hypercoagulable hyper states such as the following, even in normal pregnancies. So again, correlating with our case, our patient had severe preeclampsia with this blood pressure. She was dysnic on admission with RR of 24. And of course, she was uh, really clearly hypoxic and her ABGs revealed respiratory alkalosis with severe hypoxia. She was off of course, given oxygen support, uh, chest x-ray was um, not done no, because the events were very fast. Well, it should have been done, ideally, not to roll pneumonia and other findings. Added to that, as I mentioned, she had the health syndrome. No? With, uh, she fulfilled all of this. No? She had elevated LDH, elevated liver enzymes, and very low platelet counts. So for our patient, as, as I mentioned, we need to substantiate with additional studies, like doing placental studies through molecular and histopathological uh, research to prove the presence of the virus, and again, probably check the maternal antigenic factors to further investigate the relation of preeclampsia with COVID infection. So in summary, again, for our patient, nasopharyngeal swabs were taken both from the first government hospital and on admission at our institution. And she was negative no, in both samples, which were taken 10 days apart. Again, from my analysis, she may have been infected when she got home at the community level. The symptoms of COVID may have been masked, but then it took effect on her pregnancy, you know, for the worst uh, toll on her pregnancy. So considering the unfavorable, unfavorable outcomes in pregnant patients and in suspected cases during pregnancy again, should undergo systematic screening and close follow-up of mothers and their new needs should be emphasized. So again, for those whom we are considering um, very high risk, no, based on clinical presentation, we treat as COVID. And of course, we continuously give proper advice to our patients on discharge from the hospital. And we remind them, of course, to practice infection control measures. So thank you very much for listening. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Sibyl, for that uh, interesting discussion po, uh, for this case uh, that we have for today. I think a lot of uh, the questions in the Q&A portion of this Zoom webinar have been all answered, but uh, we'll try to get to them later on in the show. Dr. Susie. Yeah, so okay, from obstetrics, we're going to move to pediatrics. But before that, I'd just like to mention that uh, Ma'am Sibyl, yung buong uh, OBGYN section on PGH is watching. Dr. Mario Festin just texted me to say that they're all watching. I think there are many uh, in obstetrics and gynecology who are following this because unlike other conditions, when you look at maternal health and COVID, yun yung nagiging emergency talaga na pupunta sa hospital. There are many who really iindahin na lang, no? They won't go to the hospital. But for OB, I think we are seeing more and more cases of uh, Patients are being rushed to the hospital because they're going to deliver and these kinds of situations. So before we go into some conclusions, we're going to listen first to the pediatric side. And may I, may I invite Dr. Marimel Pagkatipunan, who is the COVID management in the COVID management team for the Department of Pediatrics to 
uh, to give her thoughts on the case. Dr. Pagating Mulan, please go ahead. Hi, good Mar afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. You can just call me Jean. Okay. Jean. okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, go ahead. So just a disclaimer that this is a uh, conference on the OB side. Okay, I'll just <laughs> uh, give updates on the neonatal side of this uh, case. Jing, go to slide. Uh, Jing, go to slide uh, to PowerPoint. Jing, we, we are still not seeing your slide presentation. Oh. Oh, go to uh, slideshow. On my, I know it's on slideshow. Sorry. Ah, okay. So I think you need to share your screen then. Wait, I'll just open the. Go ahead, no, Jean. So it's very interesting, Raymond. No, mm -hmm. maaring ano no, maaring the patient may have had COVID and actually recovered. COVID affected the pregnancy. That's one of the possible ways that we explain the double, the double negative. Yes. May have been caused by COVID, no? And I think what OB is telling us that they would need to do further studies. But I think, I don't think we have been talking a lot about the impact of COVID on pregnant women. We know there is a risk, but when we listen to all the risks that were shared by Dr. Bravo, I mean, for me, uh, that was really an eye opener that so many, so many um, bad things could happen if a pregnant woman develops uh, COVID. This case also um, opens up the question in terms of the different tests that we are using, Dr. Susie. I think the diagnostic dilemma that this presents really just puts into perspective the ones that uh, we are experiencing on a daily basis uh, so you 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 uh, in in quickly reviewing the case po, uh, the test results of the patient were really negative for the most part so it's really well it's really baffling that the the baby will have a positive covid test result um, I, I think this is what most of our our infection specialists have been saying you know that you can't evaluate for COVID based on the test per se. You really have to look at the history is so important. The clinical presentation is so important. So the test is just an additional tool because the tests are, are quite imperfect. Okay, Jing's got her slides up. Go ahead, Jing. Yeah, but, but I have to start on <laughs> start. Go ahead, go backward. That's fine. That's okay. I think you can, there you go. There yeah. we go. Charge na lang. There, perfect. Okay, so um, I, just as I have said earlier, no, that, uh, uh, this will be a short presentation on the side of the infant. So, um, so we received the baby, uh, 31 week, SGA 930 grams with an APGAR score of seven becoming eight, but still very unstable. So we have to um, intubate the patient that is secondary to um, probable shock, secondary to an early onset sepsis and probably a hypoxia secondary to the placental insufficiency. So the patient, our um, recommendations for uh, these infants are actually to do uh, swabs, nasal, nasopharyngeal swabs at the 30, 24 to um, 48 hour of life upon admission at the hospital. So uh, the patient became um, stable and was, we were able to extubate on day two after, the, uh, after birth. And at this time, we just, re we just did the the ETA, ETA PCR 
and received the result uh, on the third day. That's um, and on admission, the baby because of the or early on, on sepsis. No, we had to give antibiotics to to for the sepsis. So these were the antibiotics were given. But on the third day, when we saw the result of the ETA-PCR, which was confirmed COVID-19 uh, infection, um, that, that time also the patient presented with a new onset of nosocomial sepsis, uh, being um, presenting as a abdominal no, distension. And so we added um, metronidazole or for, for the drugs. At this time, uh, we did a repeat chest X-ray, but uh, it was it has no significant uh, chest findings. But uh, the laboratory showed that there uh, is decreasing uh, WBC and uh, ileus on X-ray of the abdomen. So when we received the the result of the ETA PCR on COVID-19, we did. Um, anti-inflammatory markers de determination, like IL-6, the D-dimer, the CKMB, and also the ferritin. But at that time, no, the, when we were able to um, address the nosocomial infection, we, we were able to win again that patient to CPAP. So oxygen um, oxygenation was decreased, but um, at, on the next day, no, after um, weaning to CPAP, again, the patient was noted to have a decreasing platelet, WBC, and increasing um, oxygenation was noted. And at this time, we were able to get the results of the IL-6, interleukin-6, CKMB, and also the D-dimers, which showed very high results. So that's why at this time, we, we, the patient was referred to allergology for the uh, management of the COVID, in, probable COVID infection um, because of the increasing uh, inflammatory markers. And uh, unfortunately, after giving of the IVIG and even uh, shifting of the drugs to meropenem for the patient uh, was noted to be on a cytokine storm, secondary to probable severe COVID infection. But also we got the blood culture that showed that there's an abomani sepsis. And at this time, the patient uh, became more unstable and, um, and had a demise the day after of uh, giving of the IV infusions. Okay, so uh, this table shows us, although this is the, the in adults, that shows us in COVID infection, there's the first, the early stage of the viral response, which shows that they may you know, have mild symptoms. And then the, the laboratories would show us lymphopenia. You know, the, and at this time also, if you would look at the anti, the inflammatory markers, they may now be in uh, here at this time may be uh, normal, but um, on the second stage or in the or the third stage you know, of the infection, they may have that elevation of the inflammatory markers that would support the, that the patient might be going into the cytokine storm. Okay. In neonates, we have, this is the first neonate that we manage, you know, and we receive positive for uh, COVID-19 PCR. In this case, the patient um, presented with, uh, again, with shock and uh, severe sepsis. So as part of the management, you know, so this is what we see during a cytokine storm after the a viral infection it, that it appears on the final stage of the disease frequently uh, related to having the extensive tissue damage with lung involvement and other multi-organ failure. 
And usually this is seen no, between the 7th to 10th day of illness. And um, laboratory findings of the high interleukin-6 and the D-dimers and the ferritin LDH uh, would support this. So uh, in PGH, we did this um, guideline, the treatment guideline for the COVID-19 in children. And this is the updated version now. Um, in the, at that time, when we were able to see this patient, it was last June, that time there's no um, anti antiviral drugs, no, when Desivir was not yet available. And so for this case, we were actually on this side, no, as a for as a critical for the critical case, no. The, we, the patient cannot be given the tocilizumab because of the age. It cannot be given in children less than two years of age. The convalescent plasma therapy was also not available at that time. And so we have to give the IVIG. And this um, is the, the indication for this patient. Okay. Now, in uh, SARS-CoV infection in children and newborns, no, uh, we just have uh, very few studies now because we all know that children are uh, presenting with COVID usually are actually uh, have mild infections, mild to moderate infection. And in the, in the case, 25 cases no, in this uh, study in Europe, um, of newborns with SARS-CoV-2 uh, identified, no. again, it's uh, all, all of them are, majority of them are mild and only 12% are actually uh, severe. And 40% would present with dyspnea, okay, fever, and also feeding intolerance. So uh, in a study also, they showed that the mother is, uh, is positive only in 84% of the cases. And the morbidity in newborns may actually be related to the hypoxemia in the infected mother that was discussed earlier because of the increased risk of um, also of perinatal adverse events such as birth asphyxia and then premature birth as in our case. So these severe cases may also progress um, they progress to acute respiratory distress syndrome, septic shock, uh, refractory metabolic acidosis, and also coagulation dysfunction. But the maternal fetal vertical transmission is still controversial. No? Because in this uh, paper uh, from Turkey, they only see viremia in 1% of COVID-19 uh, cases suggesting that the placental and fetal seeding might be rare. Okay, other um, journals that uh, we've seen and is available, the vertical transmission is still a controversial issue, okay, and that the studies for trans placental transmission is still very limited. And this is just one of the a journal that shows that the evidence for and against a vertical transmission for SARS-CoV may um, be very rare in by intrauterine infection because we all know that uh, there's very low viremia, but and also the lack of the viral receptor, which is your ACE2, you know, in the placental cells. But there's also perinatal infection that they have seen that causes the uh, during the va vaginal delivery, because of the potential exposure to the maternal feces, 30% of them uh, have got infected no? as positive also in their maternal feces. So the exposure may be uh, through maternal respiratory secretions, also after birth. And so these are the, um, the, the possibility no? that getting the positive PCR in the nasal swab in the first week of life may be due to the exposure to the mother. But mostly the babies are asymptomatic. And if they got infected, they will uh, have lethargy, fever, or respiratory symptoms. Again, several studies from other um, countries, they have very low uh, numbers yet. 
and there is no COVID infection uh, being detected from the mother to the uh, child. And also in Wuhan, China, where they review you know, the nine pregnant women with confirmed COVID uh, pneumonia, and um, there's no evidence. And it, they did even the um, testing for the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 in amniotic fluid, cord blood, even the neonatal so, uh, the throat swab samples, and including uh, some samples from breast milk. And, but uh, currently there's no evidence yet you know, to say that there's uh, intrauterine um, transmission. Okay, so as we, as I have said earlier, all the newborns now, um, born to a mother with confirmed COVID-19 infection within 14 days or before the birth or at least 28 days after birth and who had had direct contact with any person with confirmed infection, they are suspected uh, newborns. Thus, in our, um, in our institution, we do you know, um, screen all these newborns born to mothers with COVID probable or confirmed infection. Uh, screen, uh, we do the NP swab on the 24th hour of life. So we, we have seen that infected mothers may be at increased risk for severe respiratory complication and thus can also transmit the virus through uh, respiratory droplets even um, after you know, the delivery and during the breastfeeding. So we recommend that researches on the possibility of vertical transmission be done also. So with that, I would like to share that in our wards, COVID wards, we are seeing also um, neonates, uh, also young children you know, being infected with COVID. And I think uh, we will have our own uh, sharing with that next time you know, for, the for this webinar. So I hope you reserve your questions for pediatrics on the next uh, webinar for uh, our sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jing. More questions come up from that presentation, no? Parang, ano, ano? Parang, kanina, kala ko na-clinch na natin. Mukhang meron pang mga questions tayo, no? Na, I mean, of course, this, this mother died immediately, no? So, anyway, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more, and I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, but this is essentially a admission mortality for obstetrics and gynecology. No, within four hours, they did heroic efforts to save this mother's life, but they could not. And the baby survived, but the baby was also intubated right away, very, very sick child. And I think before we go into the technicalities of the management, let's uh, pause a little bit and talk about what this means for the team and the health workers who are going through this process of, you know, a mother who, who dies in front of you and a baby who is very, very sick in a pandemic context where we do not know if they're really positive or negative and what is the effect of that on, on the team. So we've got uh, on our panel, Dr. Lourdes, Ignacio, Lulu Ignacio, as known to many, is uh, our professor emeritus for psychiatry. And um, she's going to respond and react a little bit to this case and probably give us some, some insight on how health workers can, can cope in this, in this kind of environment where I'm sure for the doctors, this is one of many cases that you see in a day. So Dr. Lulu, welcome to the webinar. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. <clears throat> As a psychiatrist, I truly feel privileged in participating in this conference. Although I know that many of you in fact wonder why a psychiatrist in the panel of reactors, malayo kami sa OBGYN sa pedia. But I congratulate the organizers of this event for inserting me in the panel of reactors and the hosts, my dear friend Susie Mercado and Raymond Sarmiento, for making me see that somehow 
psychiatry and mental health is part of health and has a place in the discussion of this case for all of us probably to gain some lessons to learn as we go through our daily lives as health professionals, especially as medical doctors amidst this pandemic. I also thank Dr. Hanna Sonilia for presenting this case in a manner that she could really mirror the reality of the heroic case management of Dr. Isa Matibu of Hopi and Dr. Helia Villa of Pedia. In her case summary, as you heard earlier, Dr. Hanna has given us a glimpse of the humanity of our young doctors. These young doctors have had to contend with this 27-year-old young pregnant woman who was battling for her life in the OB delivery room. Many questions may have come to their minds as they started helping her. Why was her congenital heart disease not attended to well? Why did she not have a regular prenatal checkup? to prepare her for the delivery of her baby? Why are members of her family who accompanied her to the hospital not easily cooperative in giving them clear answers, especially about possible COVID exposure? Are these quote-unquote neglect in health care or adequate prenatal care simply a consequence of the social deprivation and poverty of this family? Or are they also afraid that if they're known to have a positive COVID member, that their neighbors will discriminate against them in the barangay? I am, however, sure that despite all these questions, Dr. Matibo, the OB resident, went ahead to do the right procedures in the most compassionate way she could to deal with the patient's decompensating heart her pre-eclamptic state and her failing respiratory function, which makes the possibility of a COVID infection more likely, increasing the risk of maternal mortality, while at the same time, coping with the least delays in administrative support to undertake the necessary procedures. She was able to deliver a 930 pounds live preterm baby all this, however, culminated right in front of her eyes, this young woman's death, nonetheless. The baby was transferred to the pediatric NICU, and again, our pediatricians, then within 24 hours, found her to be COVID positive. However, the baby softened again in the eyes of our young pediatricians after nine days. I am glad to read in her case summary that Dr. Sundilio writes, sadness, frustration, helplessness, guilt, and feelings of incompetence were some of the things that haunted us as the patient died in front of us. Despite the fact that the team did what they could in the fastest possible time, this happens almost daily among us. And this is heightened and made worse by the continuing uncertainty that we prevail with the present COVID pandemic. Uncertainty in all of us. No one is spared. There are times when things get out of control, Dr. Sambilio writes, and we can only cling to God for ultimate position. Emotional healing is gained most of the time this way, unquote. Although we don't ordinarily see the above lines in the clinical case protocol, and I saw the original of the clinical case protocol and had time to discuss it with Dr. Sambilio, and she did very well. And I also now truly look forward to the fact that we doctors, could start to include this in our case right now. Our feelings, our dilemmas, and the things that help us deal with it. Because I think to deal with that 
is to deal not only with the medical situation, but the uncertainty of the time. In Dr. Asimbilio Kisa, he said, this emotional healing could improve us and be the best physician that we want to be. In last week's webinar, the doctor as patient, our speakers who are among our top and respected physicians affirmed the fact that their recoveries were beyond the range of medications and procedures given to them. They affirmed that they recovered because they gained peace in confronting their fears of death through various forms of prayer and reunion with that God. What has therefore become clear to us, and we in the mental health field have been on the forefront here, that in crisis situations and extreme life experiences, like what we have been also subjected to in our country, natural disasters, violence, and conflict, now pandemic, we in the health professions need to be aware that we start now to reframe our view of health truly with a holistic view. To maintain our own health, our families, and those among the men and women who seek out health, we must remember that health is the state of a man's physical, mental, social, or now what we call psychosocial, and spiritual well-being. For this defines our humanity as we extend this to our families, our patients, and most anyone that we are asked to help. And we must recognize that it is where our compassion springs forth. As has been proven during this extreme life experience, attention to the psychosocial and spiritual needs of responders and healthcare professionals is vital in considering as important as the physical needs, the procedures, the medications. These professionals generally are really quite sensitive as human beings and socially aware with a strong desire to help. They have a steadfast dedication to their work. However, in their zeal and commitment to their work, they will tend to deny their own deeds, overlook or even de-emphasize the frustrations in their work, always coming up with the image, I am strong, despite the fact that they're already going out. Hence, they are at risk for what we now really raise a red flag for, which is burnout or secondary traumatization. Let me deviate there because I think all of us must really be conscious of the fact that even though we extend all these heroic measures, we still need to take care of our own health, not only physical, but psychosocial, because it only takes 72 hours for one to really burn out if one does not address this. Burn out being a state of physical and mental exhaustion, a feeling of personal depletion, a worsening of oneself by excessively strong expectations to be strong. And oftentimes the word depletion, exhaustion, excessive striving is there that could only mean really slowing down, possibly not even that. Another risk is that of vicarious or secondary traumatization, which is a form of a traumatic stress to those exposed to traumatic events that's frequent death, violence, intrusive injury, and thoughts are really there and this can again effectively immobilize the particular person or health professional. 
to a certain extent, some people now refer to this as compassion fatigue. Where then does a health professional grow strength to preserve his or her own humanity, especially when there is endless suffering and frustrations? And I was listening already to the discussions, and it seems to me that as COVID progresses on and there is no seemingly no end to it yet, I was just looking into a newspaper clip and Singapore had come up with the fact that the Philippines is now the number one hotspot for COVID. As we struggle with this, with this, we put ourselves at risk. And since death it's really right in front of us. We cannot avoid but confront our own mortality, our own death. A study that was done some time ago by us, what's wrong and what's right in the Philippines, has identified three major coping mechanisms in most of us. These are spirituality, a Bionian spirit stemming from a strong sense of family and joy or union. This study has categorically stated that the result of the Filipino state are courage, daring optimism, inner peace, as well as the capacity to genuinely accept the tragedy or crisis, even death. Among those who come to us, psychiatrists, remember, we probably have the also just as easy times as you guys. So it was anxiety, panic, and depression is in the air. I stop people from saying there's going to be an anxiety epidemic. I think anxiety is spared, has spared no one. And we, and oftentimes when they come to us for professional help, my question to this patient eventually proceeds from medical facts to an existential spiritual issue. In the psychiatrist's room, are you afraid to die? This oftentimes leads, interestingly enough, to a relaxation by this patient who is really hyperventilating to start talking about death. And the patient on the topic that of lives and deaths are actually not really within our own control, but that of a supreme being who has given us life. It may seem quite heavy here, but oftentimes there has been difficulty to even talk about death. And maybe psychiatrists are about the good people that will confront just about anything there. And death is one of the heavy issues, communicating death, but it's important that a big medical professional, health professionals, could brought this issue now. Because as we go through our sessions, after the discussions of the anxiety, the depression, and the panic, the anxiety, fear, panic, transforms to calmness, relief, and relief from apprehension and dread. Addressing this issue, however, allows us to find some degree of peace, accepting in fact our interconnectedness with the Supreme Being, and therefore we are not fully alone in the experience. Time is a little limited for me to expand a little bit on that, but I had hoped that as we now have to do this work, we need to confront that because we know that death is really not anybody else's choice. We psychiatrists are also confronted with death and heart because they are the suicidal people who will be making a choice or making a choice to die. But interestingly enough, they don't. And just quite realize that the choice is not there. The choice of living and dying is not ours. It's really from the one 
to create an us. And as we do this, we become connected to the God we have, the Supreme Being, and therefore, we cannot feel truly alone in the experience. In fact, we draw strength in confronting life and death as it keeps us in our practice with a much more reassuring feeling that we have innate strength because we do have this connectedness with our creator. That's why we have found that the most coping mechanism, the strongest coping mechanism in our country, and it was really so nice to listen to Dr. Rodi too, saying after all this beautiful discussion of his, of his case last week, that he finally really found peace, accepted what is coming, what are the various medications that are being tested on him. When he and his nurse started to deal with the spiritual aspect that is confronting them, and as they went through the 21 days of COVID illness, they went through also the peace that somehow death life are just about the same. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ignacio, for uh, helping us frame uh, not just the clinical dimensions of this case, but its impact on on the team and the importance of a discussion of death in in a webinar series like this. This is the first time we're actually talking about a truly tragic event. It, I mean, when you're seeing the PowerPoint presentation, they're just presenting it very factually, but these are two lives that were lost by a team that was really working very hard. So I'm going to ask Dr. Stella Jose, who is our Deputy Director for PGH, to give a response to all of the three presentations and sort of tie it up, tie it up as you see it. Um, what does this mean for us in, in practice at, at PGH? Are you there? Uh, yeah. At this time, uh, during this time of the COVID pandemic, it's really, the doctor is really in a very difficult position. Uh, it is like it is like playing God in quotation, because uh, some patients, you know, like in the ER, the waiting list is already 18. You cannot admit all these patients because there is no vacancy. And then uh, there, there are so many patients that want to get in, and then you have to decide who is the priority. It is so difficult for the doctor to say no, that we cannot admit you right now. Um, it's so hard to say no, it's easier to say yes. But in, like in this case, in this OB patient, she was managed in another hospital, and then she was sent home, and then she only stayed with us for like, four hours, it, the time was too short. So there was even a question from the audience, why did we not do a cesarean section? In these cases, doing a cesarean section will be more dangerous for the patient because there will be more blood loss. It will be faster to do a normal delivery and uh, it will facilitate even the management both of the baby and the mother. As mentioned by Jean, she said that uh, there is sepsis, so the baby should be attended to at once. But now to the going back to the question of Susie, the doctor is in that that position to make such critical critical judgment. And I think you have to be strong inside, strong in your faith, strong in your dedication, in your willingness to serve without any any other consideration. It's not about nababalita ka, namagaling ka, and ganon. It's more of patient care. Ako, yun ang dapat ilagay sa ulo natin dito eh. Yun ang dapat natin matandaan na ang importante ay yung pasyente. Hindi yun, nagmamadali ka, kailangan mo nang umalis, o kaya 
kulang nito, kulang yan, alam na natin yun, but the PGH is trying its best to serve all the healthcare workers. Do you know that we even had a hospital-wide uh, COVID RT-PCR for all the healthcare workers? We want to show our healthcare workers that we are with them in this pandemic. It is not like we're in an ivory tower and they're all down there, bahala na kayo. No, it's not like that. Even our PGHPA, the Physicians Association, pag meron silang mga kinaklama, we have a meeting face-to-face -face meeting with them, with the IM residents, ganun din. Face-to-face, -face, hindi kami natatakot magkasakit. Nagpupunta kami doon sa Guason Hall to meet them and to hear them out. So the admin is doing its part uh, with the support of Chancellor Menchit Padilla. You know, it's, uh, it's a very good, this situation is really the test for all of us that we have to rise up to the situation. Other hospitals are closing. Hospital ng Maynila, Pabella, but PGH should not close. We are the last resort of our people and we are here to serve. Yun ang bottom line of it all. Alam ko yung sinasabi ni Ma'am Lulu. Ma'am Lulu, pasensya na. Luluhod ako sa'yo. <laughs> Nagkamali ako ng, ng, ano, <laughs> ng pag-introduce. Pasensya na po, Ma'am. Luluhod na ako to apologize sincerely. Pero what she said is all true. What she said is all true. Every patient that you lose, some part of you goes with the patient. Some part of your mental strength goes with the patient. We all felt bad. You know, my department did not want me to have this presented. Sabi nila sa akin, Stella, ang dami namang ibang kaso. Bakit yan pa? Namatay ang pasyente. Sabi ko, kasi kaya siya kailangan i-present. We should tell the people that there are cases like this and what we should do about them. How will you process it in your mind? Madali mag, mag kwento ng successful story. Marami kami niyan. Mas marami yan. Siguro, more than a hundred. Ang, ito lang ang alam ko na naging mortality namin. But, this one, there's a puzzle here that we have to answer. Dr. Wilma Baltasar was asking, so in the end, what happened? How did the mother get it? Ang sagot ko sa kanya, as explained by C. Bill, it can be that she acquired it in the community and then she cleared the infection, but in that process, the virus was already transferred to the baby. Or because of the timing of the swabbing, hindi tama yung time, kaya nandun tayo sa false negative. Whichever it is, the patient was in failure. Ang kanyang, sabi ko nga kay Edison T. Edison, sinign out namin yan sa death certificate as uh, the compensated heart disease. Because he was saying that the TB, the Eisenmengeris patient, can also have hemoptysis. True, but she also had TB. So at this point, since not, no post-mortem was done, we can definitely say for sure what is the, the post-mortem uh, post, uh, findings. No? Because there's no uh, autopsy. We cannot do autopsy at this time. Okay? So... Um, I don't think pathology will allow it because magkakaroon ng aerosol generating ano pa yan, procedure and patients who are suspected of COVID dapat ikikremate, so immediate cremation. So, but my point is, you know, you see even the audience, you know, Dr. Wilma Baltasar is the former chairman of surgery, you know, all of them are asking, so ano na ngayon yung ganun? So see, even if uh, even if it's a well discussed, there are some questions in our mind. So I think when doing webinars, it's only it's not only to enlighten us on all that is known about it. We also have to investigate what is not known about it. And not all cases, not all patients can be saved. It some patients are just truly far far gone in their illness that is so difficult to save them. But the PGH is doing its part in this pandemic. When everything else has, has closed, PGH will still remain open. Thank you, Susie, for in, inviting. Actually, I nagpresenta ako, Ma'am Menchit. Eh. Nagpresenta ako to be, <laughs> to be, uh, to be uh, opening remarks. Yun ang alam ko, opening remarks. Pero it's all right.
Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stella, for that uh, wonderful reaction po. And thank you for giving us uh, sort of a perspective and the role, the critical role that PGH plays in the whole ecosystem po as we fight COVID-19. It's very important po that uh, we highlight not just the successes at PGH, but also the human stories, the human element uh, in this uh, whole virtual grand rounds. At this point, may we call on our dear uh, UP Manila Chancellor po, uh, Carmen Sita Padilla, to give a few words and her reactions po to the presentations. I actually just want to mention um, the first few sentences of Hannah when she was asked, uh, how are you? And, um, and it's really commendable for her to say in a very positive way that I'm learning and I have new lessons. And she said that, you know, one thing I've learned is how that I have to, just exactly how to protect myself. And I think, you know, for, for PGH, and I, I know there are many residents and fellows who are listening to us, you've got to look at the positive side of work in PGH. And you have to come in with that kind of attitude that every patient, for every patient, there is actually something. For every patient, we can learn something. I also would like to appreciate when she said that we need emotional healing because, you know, when you see patients die right and left, there has to be a process for us in administration to find the way uh, that we address these concerns. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, we, we can't be talking only about the technical case. And I'm really happy now that we're looking at another dimension on how to deal with death because you will only get this case when you're rotating in psychiatry. But what we're saying now is that regardless of whether you are, we have to look at how the patients are feeling. Usually we think of how, are, how is the family going to accept this? But today we're saying, what about the health worker? How are we going to help them? And of course, you know, the, for our reactors, uh, for the pediatrician, Dr. Saibel and Dr. Jing, we ended up with questions. And I think that's the role of PGH now. I, my challenge to PGH now is we've got to gather this data so that we can give some answers to these questions. And true enough, you know, for every case, for every case that we, we resolve or not resolve, you probably have, I've listed a number of questions. And of course, you know, to Dr. Lu, it's, a, it's always a pleasure to listen. And um, I picked up a few points I'd like to say in closing from what you've said, and I think it's meant for everybody. But I'll stop at the point to give some time for people to ask questions from the audience. have questions from the audience. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Chancellor Padilla, uh, for that wonderful reaction. Po. Um, let's start with a few questions uh, that will be directed po, to Dr. Sibyl. Um, so it, this probably would not sound too technical, Dr. Bravo, no? but the question would relate to how did you, how was the reaction or how did you fully explain to the family of the patient that even with repeated negative RT-PCR tests that the patient may have contracted COVID? Kasi po, medyo mahirap pong kumbinsihin itong lahat po nila nakikita na negative at negative at negative pa ulit-ulit po. Uh, how was that relationship and how did that actually um, help in trying to convince them that probably that the baby also contracted it through the mother or through some other means? Dr. Sibyl. Um, yes, thank you for that question. First, um, I wasn't really uh, the, the one not to personally uh, talk to the family of the patient. But of course, I did my own uh, interview with the, a resident in charge. Uh, she was telling me that it was really hard talking to the family. She found it very hard to make the family understand that uh, the patient, uh, though clinically, you know, we saw her course and that would point out to a really, really probable COVID infection, they found it hard to accept. In fact, um, I have to say this, um, upon learning the death of the mother, uh, they were not that accepting. Uh, the family was not that cooperative, if I can use the term. And as such, so we can only surmise that they really found it hard to accept her death. Even so, the fact that um, the repeat PCR test for this patient was still negative. 
Thank you, Dr. Sibyl. And was that also the same reaction that the pediatrics department received, uh, Dr. Pakatipunan? So we learned of the death of the mother early because we, after we received the baby, and it, the baby was actually also um, critical at the start. Um, so uh, after all the after a week, then the baby died. No, we were able to uh, communicate with the father at this point to tell him what is really happening, and we were able to get. Uh, the swab for the father and that was also negative because <laughs> to see no to see that um it may happen no, that the father might be positive and that would prove no that there is that infection but it turned out again negative and the father remained asymptomatic so again um uh, what we're saying here, and also for the other questions, no, that why is there even some twins? No, one twin is positive, one twin is negative. Uh, COVID-19, no? uh, tell us on all these patients. That's why we are doing all these studies and uh, surveillance. Um, just a good news for PGH. We already have around 108 uh, babies no? uh, born to uh, confirmed positive mothers. And there's only two uh, results that we got that is fat positive. This one, this baby, and um, the other one is a, also an, uh, uh, positive, but we were able to send that baby home because that baby is a full-term infant and had a very good um, course. So and and we were able to to um, follow up that baby uh, even a few weeks up to one month now and the baby is doing fine and also the mother is doing fine. So I hope uh, this will actually be a good um, data for us. No, that in the we will we don't know yet anything about uh, COVID in the in the neonates and even for the children. So. Uh, I hope, we, like our chancellor said, that these are our researches that will really help us, and we want to share it to you later on, you know, after we have analyzed all this data. Thank you very much, Jean. So I think Raymond, you know, the time has gone so fast. Uh, we have time for one more question, and then we're going to do a sort of like a quick evaluation of the entire webinar. But we'll have to to close soon. I know there are so many questions on the chat box, and I think our panelists are answering them right now. Uh, but Raymond, take one more question. So, uh, one, of the, one of the questions here revolve around data re in relation po to um, COVID, SARS-CoV-2, and TB co-infections in adults, in children. And the other question, I will just uh, tie it up lang po, no? Would you would you expect that the course of the mother and also the baby was that more country but was that more could that be more ascribed po to COVID or to the other co-infections po that the mother had? Uh, probably this question is for Dr. Sibyl Bravo. Um, yeah, considering her stormy course and her other other medical comorbidities, I think. Even if this mother were not really infected, um, she would eventually have this uh, morbid course no? during this admission. So remember, she had um, the congenital heart defect that was unrepaired or uncorrected. She also had pulmonary tuberculosis. And at that, no, it would have been a late stage because she had history of hemoptysis, although we could also ascribe hemoptysis to other conditions as well. And of course, in her early uh, third trimester, she developed preeclampsia. So all in all, these are all uh, major comorbidities that would really, um, if not controlled or managed well ahead before term pregnancy, could really have resulted to morbidity and mortality. So again, we need to ramp up no, on how to take care of our women. And so, lalo na po in the pandemic, 
they do not know where to go eh, no? lalo na po yung mga those women who are we are taking care of no at the outpatient department they're at a loss now where to go to but of course for good news we have telehealth we have um returned to our teleconsultation yeah that's a very important i mean for me from a public health point of view i think we have one point i think about 1.6 million deliveries every year no so we in in a time of of a pandemic we really have to think of new ways of keeping our, our moms healthy, knowing how terrible the consequences of COVID be for, for the pregnant, for pregnant women. So Raymond, let's go into our um, evaluation I, first and maybe yes. our answers, and then we'll have to wind up, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we do that, uh, Dr. Susie, I think uh, Dr. Stella has something to say, just, just a final word on that question. Go ahead, Stella. Stella, go ahead. Nakamute kayo, ma'am. Papa. For our society, the Philippine Infectious Disease Society in OPGYN, uh, we came up with a guideline and it states there that uh, all pregnant women at 37 to 38 weeks must have an RT-PCR test. So oh. the purpose, yes, the purpose of this is number one, because there is a uh, Contrary to yung sa nasabi ni, uh, ni Jean, uh, meron ng mga studies, there are studies of maternal to fetal transmission. Kasi di ba, earlier they said na nawala. But uh, there are some studies who's, uh, in Wuhan na there is maternal to child transmission. Number two, uh, we want to protect also the healthcare worker. And number three, so that the baby the baby, when you give to the pediatrician, the baby will, the pediatrician will be also warned about, about the condition of uh, the possibility that the baby might be COVID positive. So, yun lang ang ko na, now we are trying to remedy uh, that situation so that the pedia will not be placed in a difficult position also. Yeah, I mean, as I recall, Raymond, right, when we were looking at, looking at, uh, pregnant woman and her child, there's just really one patient, actually, right? There's yes. really just one patient. And I think that's that's also kind of like an underlying theme in this whole webinar. Okay, over to you, Raymond. So uh, what we are seeing here, po, are the, the poll, polling number four, pre-webinar questions here. And these are the answers of our um, attendees. So mainly as the, well, the resource speaker who submitted this question po, uh, for question number one, the following statements are true except, what is the correct answer po? Um, yes, the correct answer is option number three. It's the wrong statement. So okay. we learned that first, second, and fourth statements are true. Thank you, Dr. Sibyl. So for question number one, the wrong, the, the, the answer for this question po, no, is the use of nitrous oxide or laughing gas as an anesthetic is highly recommended. For question number two, which states a suspected rare maternal fetal transmission was detected to an infected pregnant woman, uh, was asked to take investigational drug for COVID-19, which of the following drugs should you question due to detrimental effects on neonates? Oh, I think the correct answer here is option number three is ribavirin. All the others are class C drugs, US FDA class C category C drugs, your chloroquine, your lopirito, and then desivir are quite safe use during pregnancy as long as you believe that there will be more benefits than harm for the mom and the baby. For ribavirin, take note, ribavirin is a class X drug because um, it's an RNA, RNA polymerase inhibitor and it has been shown to uh, have teratogenic effects during pregnancy for the neonates. So the Thank you. letter C. That, that will be rebavirin. Thank you so much, Dr. Sibel. Question number three states, the ideal test for a 35-year-old pregnant patient at 37 weeks AOG. Okay. Of course, we learn and we keep on learning and emphasizing that the diagnostic test of choice is still your molecular test that's your PCR swab test. So majority of our patients, of our attendees, got the right answer. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bravo. And last but not the least, our last question, I think this is from uh, Professor Emeritus Ignacio. The following are the Filipinos' major coping mechanisms. Uh, which is the correct answer, Ma'am Lulu? All of the above. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ma'am Lulu, for that uh, 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 question, for sharing the correct answers po. I think uh, because in the interest of time and because we are, I think, a little bit running over time, uh, this is at the point wherein we call in our Chancellor to give uh, a few words as uh, closing remarks for our virtual Grand Rounds number two. Chancellor Padilla. Okay, thank you. Thank you again to uh, UP and PhilHealth for season two of Stop COVID deaths, and that in today's session, we have a few points to, to bring home in this pandemic and probably in any other case that we have in the hospital. Let us care for all, the patient, the family, and the health worker. Second take home point is that as a training institution, we must gather the data so that we can make proper recommendations for future care of our patients. This is a challenge now for pediatrics and obstetrics to guide us with information that you have. And Dr. Jing, I took note of your 108 neonates who actually went home. We want to know what happened to them. Um, the, we must be conscious of um, Allow me. And in the, last, uh, in the last point, let me, in the technical point, just remember that prematurity is a complication of SARS-CoV-2, and we must be aware that uh, comorbidities can really affect the care of, uh, of our patients. But let me end with a few lines that I've picked up from Dr. Lulu Ignacio. And um, Lulu Igna Dr. Lulu Ignacio said that this pandemic has, is giving us an opportunity to reframe our notion of health, that it should not only be physical, but also mental, psychosocial, and spiritual. And that um, in this time when we have this opportunity, we have to stay connected with a higher being. And with that, we can be better doctors to our patients. So once again, thank you to our viewers. We know we have a standing room only right now, and also those viewing at Facebook. Maraming salamat ulit sa inyong lahat. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Dr. Raymond and Dr. Susi. Thank you, Chancellor Padilla, for, the, for those wonderful uh, closing remarks. I'll give the floor over to Dr. Susi just to give uh, a brief overview of what will happen for our next week's webinar. Okay, so be with us next week. We're going to talk about uh, senior citizen. We're going to talk about seniors. All right, so again, another, another angle to, to the COVID, COVID response who develops COVID and then has a swollen leg. So next Friday, please join us. That's going to be a very interesting discussion. And I think Dr. Enrico Gruet is in the audience uh, from Cebu Doctors. He's going to give uh, the introductory remarks. As I said, this webinar is, not, is going to include and has been including many other schools and many other hospitals. So, Stay with us next week. Very exciting topic. Senior citizen with COVID and a swollen leg. Raymond. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado, who is our special envoy of the President for Global Health Initiatives. Maraming salamat po. At uh, katulad po lang sila po ni Dr. Susie, magsama-sama po tayo uh, from 12 noon to 2 p.m. every Friday. Let's make this a Friday habit po. Sana po, kasing dami po na mga nag-register. Na for this webinar po, we had almost 2,300 registrants for this webinar and more than 400 po ang nanonood, ang nanonood sa YouTube uh, na live streaming po ng TVUP channel. That is in addition to the standing room only po that we have at the Zoom webinar. So on behalf of the UP Phil Health Webinar Series team, I'm Dr. Raymond Sarmiento. Keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online. The enemy remains unseen. I'll keep your hand in mine. Let's say a prayer one more time. I know you long for home, but I am here, you're not alone. I'll stay with you until the coast is clear. The other's pain before my fears, 
The others laugh They fall my tip But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? My God, how long will this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'm here to hold the line I'll keep my head Until my Hold on to the word he gave This time will come to pass Cause this salvation's made to last He'll carry you to see the break of day The others pain before my fears The others laughs before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask do I have strength to carry on? My God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'm here to hold the line. I'll keep my head wet until my head dies. From my fears, the others laugh before my tears, but right behind the mask, I look into myself and ask, Do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'll keep my word, you would as mine. The others pain before my fears, I'm pushing on the spine of tears. Please take us through another day. Just hold my hand. And I will hold the line.